is a writer, director, and producer whose career has been about expanding the idea of what diversity in filmmaking really means. He's a former vice, vice president of Lee Daniels Entertainment and now serves as the VP of Podcasts and Adaptations at Blue Monday. He's a Black and Latino writer with a penchant for classic storytelling and was listed as a top 25 writers to watch by Movie Maker Magazine. Now, Kevin obviously loves to defy stereotypes, as you already heard. He likes to wear his button, his shirt's unbuttoned because he cannot be restricted. We are here for that. He just recently wrapped directing the Gridiron Game for Fox Studios, to be and Mark Vista, as well as show running Moo, a historical drum, dramatic podcast series produced by Audible and the Oscar-winning Black studio, Macro. In other words, he's a badass. Additionally, Kevin is directly and co-writing a feature with screenwriter Terry Rossio from Variety. He sold the horror graphic novel On the Last Day of Christmas to Humanoid Comics, for feature film adaptation, meaning he's got his work in a lot of different places and a lot of different spaces. And you can also hear that he's working in multiple jobs. So he's just being creative and not allowing himself to be boxed in. His next film, Big Bad Billy Gunn, was listed on the Academy Awards Nichols Fellowship and is being produced by Shannon McIntosh from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for Quentin Tarantino. Now, Aside from all of that, Quentin has, I'm sorry, not Quentin, Kevin has also written the script for the film Zombie Broad Day, a quirky horror comedy musical that is being directed by Jonas Ackerman from Netflix's Pop Polar, with music by Dave Stewart of the Arrhythmics. In addition to his writing and directing, Kevin is also a political pundit and is a regular on the Spectrum News program, The Undecided, by, hosted by Alex Cohen. Kevin, our boy has a long and bright future, and we hope you enjoy the ride. Let's give it up for Kevin, our boy. Thank you. Thank you. That, you was, that was a little bit like a eulogy. I feel like I'm dead. No, you are very much alive, and we are very grateful to have you here, Kevin. Um, before we get started, I think I'm, I'll kind of um, dispense with the introductions because I want to save time. Sure. And the thing to keep in mind is what you're looking at is the, the season four class of Flip the Script Film Fellowship Fellows. So we started on June 26th, and from that day to last Thursday, July 6th, these young people had to develop a concept, develop a pitch, develop the, uh, the story, spine, all of the things that go into that, and then deliver a first draft of their screenplays by July 5th, and we selected the winners on July 6th. So they've been quite busy being creative. Um, raise your hand, Miles and Kayla. These are our two season four winners. So in, on July 17th, we're going to produce Miles' film. What's your title? Just in time. And we're going to produce Kayla's film. And that, that name might change because we're not in love with it, but we don't hate it. Let me hear the title again. Well, I didn't hear, no. Across the border. Across the border. Okay. Across the border and just in time. So you're gonna have to speak up. Okay. So that's what we're doing. And the reason that I wanted to ask you to come and talk to these young people, Kevin, is because obviously we know each other through social media and you've always been very kind and very um generous with your time and talent. So they have some questions that they would like to ask you during this half hour or so that we have together. So, but we can start off with you telling us anything that you want us to know, and then we'll kind of go from there. Um, I will say, uh, just to kind of start off, whatever you ask me, you're going to get a real answer. I, I am, I can't, I don't have that thing. I don't have that sugarcoating thing. And I, I really can't like bullshit in the way to protect, like, I just really want to tell people the truth so you know what to expect. So I am looking forward to whatever question you may have. Uh, and hopefully you can kind of like take the answer and run with it. Um, because I'll probably say a lot of things you might, ne might not necessarily have heard before, but I guarantee you that it's going to be helpful for a career. Because one thing you always have to remember is that you're not trying to sell individual projects. You want a career in the business. So there's a lot of things that go into that, 
other than just writing. So that's just one thing I want to start off with. Thank you for that. Um, and to start us off, I'm going to ask Miles to ask his question. Okay. Your name? Um, hi, my name is Miles Bichard. I'm a season four winner for Flip the Script. I wrote the story just in time. And my question for you is, like you were saying about how, what's it called? You don't want just to sell one of your stories. You want a career telling the stories in this piece. My question is, what type of relationships and like what type of advice do you have to cultivate in order to keep your ideas like still in a position to be bought by people who want to produce them? like what is yeah, the say, i'm so sorry you cut out for a second miles uh, keep going i'm sorry no i was just i just wanted to know like what the process behind that is like in the fact of like continuing building a reputation as a good writer Got it. Um, so it's a couple of things. Um, number one, I would say your approach to anything that you write, you have to be dedicated to be to being as specific as possible. And what I mean by that is a lot of times you will hear a kind of a popular cliche talking point that that the system is rigged against you or you know people don't want it and it's politics and whatever no it is just that finding a really good script is very very difficult and most of the people that kind of like complain they're not doing this not doing that and you kind of like read their stuff you're like well i see why so that's that's kind of the the, the first advice uh, that i would say is be as specific as possible an example of that i'll give you a good example and a bad example of like you know when these things don't work and when it does work. Um, I realize now looking at you guys, you're, you're rather young and I feel like I'm 80,000 years old, but there was a movie <laughs> back in the day called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. So this is a movie that grossed more than $300 million domestically. Why? Not because every single Greek person in America went to go see it a bunch of times. It was just that the story, this very specific story of this woman who had an overbearing family, you know, in terms of getting married and, you know, all the, the, the traditions that go, it, everyone related, whether you're Black, whether Latino, Italian, you know, Asian, that dynamic, works again, when you're so specific within a culture, people tend to relate. So that's kind of the first thing is that your story, when, when you write something, you should always feel confident that no one on the planet could have written what you just wrote. That is a big one. So for instance, even till this day, till this day, I read screenplays that'll have things like, oh, I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. If you have that type of like tired old trophy sayings in your scripts, toss them. Anything that sounds familiar or something like from a meme or something gets repeated all the time, that should be nowhere in your script, nowhere. What you need to do is figure out like that same feeling, like that cliche corny, I just do it with my mouth a little bit. Well, what are you trying to say there? So what you're trying to say is something very specific. So be specific with your words. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, you're, when you approach this business as a business, you have a leg up. And I understand that we're all creators, but this is a business, right? So you, if you're like, okay, I'm going to write a, a feature or a television or whatever, you need to block out time every single day that you're writing. You can't just sit back, ah, I ain't feeling it this Monday, man. I don't know, man. The Sunday was kind of rough. You know, no, no, it's a job. So you you wake up, you sit down, and you write. You write. Now, here's the thing: is it all going to be gold? Absolutely not. Which is why the other very important part of this business is being objective to where you are and being honest with yourself. Because if you can't pick up one of your scripts and look at it and objectively say, well, hey, this little piece here was good, but all this was shit, then you know you're messing up because we all write shit. I got a lot of screenplays to show you that are shit if you want to read some garbage, you know what I mean? So, but you, but you have to understand to recognize it. And then when you realize it, that's how you get better. And then the kind of the counter example, even though this movie was a crowd pleaser, but I do use it as an example, is um, Hidden Figures, right? Now, with a story like Hidden Figures, that even though it was a crowd pleaser, it was um, a bunch of bullshit, man. Because, because in reality, if it was more specific and people understood what the story was, Katherine Johnson, what made it a significant is that she was uh, all the way to the right. Uh, what is your, what is your um, 
What is your name next? No, other side. Sorry, the left. What is you? Yeah, you. Say again, I couldn't hear you. Uh, oh, okay. Katherine Johnson was as light as Liz. She had blue eyes. And what ended up happening was she was in that room with all these other people because she was passing. And her uh, friends, who were dark like Eunice, was not. That's the real story. And then you could have had some really great conflict between the friends because Catherine's taking advantage of the privilege she had. And these brown girls are in the trenches doing their stuff. That's a really specific, great story that if they understood kind of the dynamics, that would have been like a real like, wow, okay, that's, you know, now I get it. Now, because I can understand that dynamic. Um, I've been talking for like 10 minutes. I hope that answers your question, Miles. No, you're great. You're great. Don't 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 censor yourself. It's good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next question from Kayla. <clears throat> and you see she's prepared. She has her notes. Uh, okay, across the border. I'm waiting. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> your name your um, My name is Kayla Nally, and I'm 21 years old. And I wrote across the border. How do you think the future of Hollywood will turn into for like the new generation of creators, with like all the strikes going on and everything. That's a that's a great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna get kind of deep with this one. Um, <laughs> let's see. I try not to get canceled here. Um, okay, so th there's a couple of things happening. With because you mentioned the strike, and so I'll talk specifically about the Writers Guild. What people need to understand about any of these type of movements, and we can kind of equate it to. Um, minimum wage, right? Because, you know, a lot of it is like, this is the lowest that, this is the lowest that you can pay us, right? So what tends to happen is we tend to look at these things as good and bad actions. Like it's a good thing for people to get money and it's a bad thing that they weren't paying. The reality is everything is a series of trade-offs. Meaning for some people, it will indeed be better. If you are a working writer or maybe you've gotten one or two jobs, but you're still at the level of a staff writer or still kind of like a baby feature writer, maybe you sold one thing, raising that, that, that scale, that will benefit that person. That's great. However, I will tell you, when I was a kid, I used to work at a movie theater. And at the movie theater, we had dedicated ushers. We had dedicated box office people. We had a dedicated... Uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Concession stand people. And we even had like younger people who would like, you know, help people walk around with the flashlights. And the business was able to do that because there was no minimum wage. So what that meant was more people working. So with this strike, while it's going to be good for some, now for people trying to break into the business, it's going to be bad for them. Because a studio will look at you and go, oh, you ain't done nothing before? I ain't giving you 50 grand. And I think, you know, when you try to personalize things to, to understand it, let's just say you want to redo your kitchen, right? You want to redo your kitchen. And all the kitchen modelers get together and say, okay, okay, yeah, you want to redo your kitchen. But we've all gotten together as a union and we're telling you, the customer, that the lowest you can pay anyone is $20,000. Okay, so what are you going to do? Are you going to pick the most experienced kitchen remodeler ever or take a chance on someone new? You're going to pick the experienced person because you have to spend that money. So it's kind of the same way within the business is that while certain things are good, there are trade-offs and it always means less work. Minimum wage, raising scale, whatever, good for some, but it always means less work. So you kind of have to think about that. Now, with the other thing where people talk about AI and this, whatever, Here's the other uncomfortable conversation that we need to have. Um, if you've ever tried, if you've played with AI and you know, you've tried, and by the way, this, let's just be clear, AI is just software where it just takes information throughout the internet and puts it together. It's not some thinking Skynet thing that gets conflated all, all the time. But if you've ever done that and go, hey, write me a story about whatever, just to see what it, you'll get, it's going to be a very uh, like kind of like mediocre, something like no personality, no nothing. Just like, it's just going to be like, a decent example of what you asked for, right? Now, when you consider all of the content that you on movies, television, that's actually indicative of how it works anyway. Most writers are mediocre, which is why when you watch something amazing, you're like, that was amazing because it's rare because things that are excellent is rare just by definition. So what I believe is going to happen is it's going to put a premium on quality. Because, you know, there's going to be, listen, you've seen 
either Transformers or whatever, something, whatever you, you've watched where you're like, man, that was some bullshit. You know what I mean? That's the type of thing where you're not thinking about it, but for a Quentin Tarantino or for Spielberg or Cameron, whatever, there's going to be a premium on quality. So I, I do think that's going to be the future of a lot of things is that the better you are, the more opportunities you have. But that's just my own personal opinion. Addison. Now, before Addison talks, I want you to know that um, she was one of the winners from Black Girls Film Camp this year. Yes. Best Beautiful. She won Best Cinematographer. She's also a great writer, um, and she's got a lot of fire in her that will probably remind you of Avery Gouvernay. Okay. Addison, your question. <laughs> Hi, guys. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. My name is Addison. Yeah, I'm a six-year-old filmmaker. Um, so my question for you is, because throughout this process, I feel like I, I kind of struggle with being stuck on one idea. So I want to see what challenges have you faced with being stuck or on an idea or married to how you thought it should be, um, but having to change it in order to make your idea more successful? Um, that's a good question. You know, if you're, if, if you're writing, you, you can't successfully write without a group of peers that need that can read your work and give you proper feedback. Um, so one, you kind of have to be open to like if you're if you're stuck on something and you know five people read and go like, listen, man, that part with the uh, you know the dog jumping off the bridge, we I just don't like it, but you love it. But five people have said this is an issue. Then it's up to you to change it or not, you know. And, and I think you know part of the skill of being a writer. That's why I said like it's not all about writing. You also have about you also have to understand the notes. You have to understand how to address your notes because notes come in in different forms. There are notes that are truly are going to make your script better. There are notes that will yes, they will make it worse. But then there are also and this is the most confusing one. There are notes that are just different, right? Sometimes you get notes where somebody just sees a different story. It doesn't mean they're right. They just would do it differently. So you have to be able to differentiate with those type of notes where this person just wants to see a different story. Um, but past that, you know, one of the most important, excuse me, important aspects of writing is rewriting. You should be writing all the time. So if you're stuck on it, whatever, if you're stuck on whatever, well, write it the other way to see. Like it, it's, 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 it's not like you have to... Uh, it's not like a science thing where you have to get all these, you know, different people and, you know, do these different tests. No, just, just write it. It'll take you a day, if anything, just to kind of like rewrite that thought because, you know, there's a danger getting stuck on one thing because, and I know, I know you need, uh, probably knows this very, very well dealing with older writers. There are some writers who've had that one idea for 15 to 20 years and they got that one script and everyone's trying to steal it from them and you know like it's it's the greatest story in the world and you know so it's it's like nonsense like you should have 10 scripts if it, you know if i go to someone and go hey man you got like a drama answer should be yes but do you have a comedy answer should be yes but do you have an action answer should be yes you should be right i'm not saying you have to do all these different genres per se, but I'm saying if you just have one or two screenplays, that's an issue because for a career, you need a ton of screenplays. Um, one of the things, you know, in the beginning when Eunice was giving my eulogy, because I've died, you know, thought about my bio, you'll notice that I've done a lot of different things. One, because I do enjoy, I am, I am kind of like, a nerd in that sense where, you know, I do like line items and business. Like I have a home health business Not everything is entertainment. Like I just love this. I love sales, which I know a lot of people hate, but I do kind of like love that stuff. But, but the other part of that is because whenever someone says, okay, this will happen by Monday, it's not going to happen by Monday. You will go broke. You need to have this like, you know, a stock portfolio. You need to diversify. You need to have a lot of things going at the same time. So that includes having a lot of different scripts at the same time. Because even like, here's something that's, it's, this is a funny, weird dynamic that doesn't happen. You write a script. This script gets popular. Maybe it goes on the nickels. Maybe it goes on blacklist. Maybe, you know, a lot of people love it, whatever. You know what? A lot of times that screenplay never gets made. It's the thing that gets you your next gig. But there's so many big writers who are like, oh yeah, I wrote the screenplay and it got me my agent, got me whatever. And it was just never produced. Just never produced. And that's why I don't want people to get hung up on that one script because it's just a recipe for disaster. You just gotta be open as a writer. 
Thank you for that. You're welcome. Kennedy. Hello, I'm Kennedy Arnold. Um, I'm 23 years old. My question is, what is one of the biggest decisions you have made that's positively impacted your career leading to your success today? Um, and the reason I ask is because I feel like post college graduation, like just trying to figure out how to like break into the industry and like get to where you want to go, it's kind of an awkward stage. Because like you said, you kind of like take gigs and just like you just you're still trying to figure everything out. You know, it's no clear path for the industry. Everybody's journey is different. So I want to know like what is one big decision that helped impact your career like tremendously? That's a great question. Um, the answer, uh, for, the answer for me, and I think really, uh, I think a lot of people need to think this way, is that it was a it was a a shift in how I saw the world. It was a mental thing, right? Because that's where it starts, and it's this, and this is something that I tell my kids and my son. I have a twenty three year old uh, son, you know, and he's he's like the greatest guy in the world because he fundamentally understands this when I told him. The harder you work the easier your life will become, period. So the things that you should be doing is it has to get to a point when you just really know if you're giving something 100%. Like, look at the way people say like, oh, I would like to, you know, I would like to lose 20 pounds. Well, would you like to, or are you going to do it? Because you can do it. It's, you know, it's, it's really not hard. Just move more, eat less, and you can do it. But people the, listen to their language. I would like to, but you would be doing it if you really wanted to, right? So there's no way around doing it. Listen, to, yes, there are certain stories where somebody wrote was one thing and, you know, and, and somebody read it and their uncle, Steven Spielberg, and all of a sudden, you know, they're making this and that. Yeah, that, that can happen. I mean, it's the most rarest thing in the universe, but it can happen. But for the most part, you know, an actual career is the result of a ton of work. But you will know, you will know when you start giving life, and I forget just writing, I mean life 100%. You will know when you get there, right? You can bullshit yourself. A lot of people do it. A lot of people do it, uh, you know, and, and I understand because now in 2023, unfortunately, there's a currency to victimhood. You know what I mean? It's like the, there's a lot of victimhood Olympics and like, no, but, I, but I've but i been oppressed more and there's more people against me and da, da, da. I will tell you as the old man here, that is so much rarer than you think. People, where people are in life, nine times out of 10 is the result of your own actions. Whether it's good or bad, if, if you're doing good and you're killing it, you know it's the result of your actions and you're proud to say it. But if you're doing bad, you're not where you need to be. That's also the result of your actions. And you need to be able to say it. You know what I mean? Because, you know, that you can't, you, you cannot ride that bullshit forever. Eventually, it will catch up to you. It really will. I will say, though, it is, it is easier to do anything now because there's so many opportunities and outlets. And, like, there's so much out there that even most people aren't even aware of. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot. So I tell these young people, let's take a moment to just like, Google's going to be your friend for weeks and just research everything. One of the things I'm going to really tell myself when I was your age, you know, I had subscriptions to all the major magazines. That's why when I ended up getting named in Movie Maker Magazine, it was one of those like, you know, stranger than fiction moments. Like I used to buy those magazines, Premiere, Entertainment Weekly, Interview Magazine, Movie Making Magazine. And I would read them to cover to cover. And I would know who all the players are. So, uh, so remember I told you I like sales. I will tell you this one. I'm going to tell it myself. And I will tell you this anecdote to one of the things that really kind of like set a fire to my career. So because I knew I was, oh, I always knew what was going on. Back in the day at New Line Cinema, there was like, I've been talking like a rock star executive named Mike DeLuca. Like he was the guy. He was responsible for a lot of the hits back on the day of New Line Cinema. Well, he leaves, right? And I just know fundamentally, like whenever somebody leaves higher up, there's going to be chaos, right? So I called, I cold called New Line Cinema and I go like this. Hey, hey, what's going on? This is Kevin Arway. Listen, man, I know you guys know I had a couple of movies with Mike DeLuca. I do not want them to fall through the wayside. Who should I be speaking to? Because if these, if these movies fall apart, it's going to be a disaster for everyone, you included. 
And it's like, oh, okay, you need to speak to Kale Boyder. That hadn't been announced. No one knew who was taking over for Mike DeLuca, but I was told over the phone because the way I called, I get put to the, the Kale. I'm like, Kale, what's up, man? It's Kevin Arroway. Listen, I'm pretty sure Mike DeLuca told you about the movies I have. I feel like I feel like you guys are just going to shelf them. Can I come in? We can talk about maybe continuing those movies or something else. He's like, sure, man, come on in. So like when you, when you, and I'm in New York at this point. So he's like, yeah, you're coming next week. So then I literally, as a kid, I fly to LA and, you know, and just bullshit my way through this, <laughs> through this meeting. And all of a sudden I became someone who was like in the business because, you know, I just went out there and I knew what I was talking about. Now, am I saying that you should be a con artist to get into this business? No. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when people talk to you about fundamentals of this business, who the players are, what's going on, you got to know, because that's a big piece of it as well. You should know, like, huh, you know, there's a writer strike going on, so a lot of the big writers can't be writing right now. What is something that happened in the last month that I can write about and get out before anyone else because they're not writing anything? Things like that. What you, you know what I mean? Like, there's just a lot of there's a saying out there. It's like never let a good disaster go to waste. Everyone is to think that way. How can you capitalize on the world events? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. And about the writing some stories too. Yeah, I, my story was actually about the writing strike. Your story? What? I'm sorry. The story I wrote was actually about the writer's strike. Oh, okay. Well, there's there's a lot. I will tell you, there's, man, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Because you have to understand with the Writers Guild, like anything, I mean, there are factions within the guild. You know, it's not just a bunch of writers together. There are factions there. And, you know, it can get kind of intense. I mean, one of the big things is with the Writers Guild, I don't know if it will help you or not, is that it definitely caters to television writers, like their needs get talked to first, whatever, well, feature writers, they ain't got nothing. I mean, like our, our needs never get brought up. So I could, I will tell you, I could see a universe in which there is a, a split within the guild where it becomes two separate things. I can see where it's just features. I could see where showrunners do their own thing as well. I, you know, I can see a lot of different opportunities, a lot of different uh, dynamics happening within the, the strike. So yeah, it, there, there's a lot to mine there. So so good luck with that story. It could be really fun. Hi, so I'm Liv Kielis. Uh, I'm another writer on the team. And um, my question is, what's a mistake that you've made in your career? And how have you learned and grown from that experience? Um, and like the reason I'm asking this is, um, I believe that like, the way you go about your mistakes um, in your career really determine where you end up. Um, how you respond to those. So I was just um, wondering if you're um, out Actually, tough to, to narrow down one mistake. Like I've made so many mistakes. So many, you know, like honestly, like I look back at some of the things that I, I'm like, oh, Kevin, that was dumb as hell. What were you thinking? I mean, one is one that I, I mentioned before is like I wasn't, so, okay, here, so here's one specifically in 2007, I did a very big, viral, like before like viral videos were a thing, I did like a viral video that exploded. I'm talking about like everywhere. So, so it's 2000, I'll just tell you real quick. It's 2007. And I thought it would be funny to do a music video about some black dude running for president called Barack Hussein Obama. How the fuck is a Barack Hussein Obama gonna run for president? I thought it was funny. So I did this silly music video called I Got a Crush on Obama. And I got some girl and we're in New York City and she's going around and I interact. I had people interacting with her. Just a fun nonsense. I edited it and I was like, okay, well, it was what it was. We'll see what happens. The next day, it was very much, very much like a cliche movie because I got woken up at six in the morning. Go, Kevin, Kevin. I'm like, what, what, what? So give me a, your, your video is on Fox News. I'm like, what, what? And just like a movie, I turn on the TV and there's my video playing with the people talking about the, oh, and what is this video about Barack Obama and da, da, da. And I'm like, wow, that was crazy. It's on Fox News. And I flipped some channels and then 10 minutes later, it's on CNN. I'm like, oh my God. An hour later, it's on MSNBC. I'm like, what is going on? 11 o'clock rolls around The View. They're singing it on The View. Elizabeth Hasselbeck's like, Barack Obama. And she's singing, I'm like, what? 
11 o'clock that night, no, 11.30 that night, it's the Tonight Show, Jay Leno. He's talking about it in his monologue. And then Saturday rolls around and Saturday Night Live does a parody of my stupid ass video. So I'm like, this is crazy. And so it really got, I ended up going on talk shows, whatever. So UTA, one of the, you know, one of the big four at the time, you know, they reached out like, hey, we'd like to sign you. And that's, I'm like, oh my God, this is great. You know what I mean? So they signed me and okay, we're going to do some stuff. I had nothing for them. I had nothing <laughs> for them. To represent what? I was ill prepared for what I, for what I had done, I was not prepared. And that was one huge mistake that I've had all my ducks lined in a row and my scripts, and I knew this and that, whatever. Forget about it. It would have been insane. But, you know, but I was just kind of naive in the sense of like, like, I don't know what I want to do. You tell me, you're an agent. And let me tell you, that's that whole thing of like agents just like, hey, Miles, I have a job for you. That's not how it works at all, okay? Especially in the beginning. So um, that was one very big mistake is that I just was not prepared. And, and to kind of like double up on that, also not being objective enough to know when my stuff was not on par yet. So I, I would say those were kind of like two big mistakes. And I've made other ones and, you know, I've made the mistake of chasing the big agency, the big lawyer, and, you know, that it's, it's, it's little fish, big pond. You know, I had a lawyer and his, his clients were like George Clooney and Ryan Johnson. And I'm wondering why my deal hasn't gone anywhere yet because he doesn't have time for my. Do you know how much more much money he's going to make over Ryan Johnson, George Clooney than me? He's like, I'll get to it at some point. I haven't heard from him in years, so I had to switch lawyers. So I mean, I just made I've made a ton of mistakes, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just it really is just about just recognizing it and being honest with you. It's. I will say this, and you will find this to be true in life, just in general, outside the business. Most people lie to themselves. Not only do most people lie to themselves, I will tell you how the world has changed. Back in, back in our day, when Eunice and I were, were your age, um, there was something called consequences and accountability. You could do some dumb shit, but the way the world was is that there was a moral compass to it. And it was like, ah, oh, no, that's not, no, we do not co-sign this, this is bad. And you knew right then and there that something was bad. Well, that's gone. I, I, I feel so bad for you young kids because it's like, it, we're very much in an anything goes society and, and everyone's scared to not say that's okay because you'll be attacked by the very, very loud, loud, you know, minority. So um, it, what it does is it, infant, it infantilizes a, a new generation that thinks that no matter what they do, there are no consequences and, you know, anything. And if you cry long enough and if you, you know, claim victimhood long enough that you'll get what you want. It's not, that's not the move. And I don't know how much longer that's sustainable, but, you know, that's, that's unfortunately the era that we're in right now. Marquise. Hey, how you doing, Mr. Kevin? Uh, there is Marquise. always, I'm sorry, there is always a black dude named Marquise. Why, why is there always... It's a common name. We all have different colors, so that's the same thing. <laughs> um, my question is, what's been the biggest challenge for you as an independent filmmaker, uh, uh, director, or writer, and how do you navigate through that? Or how did you? Um, I, I realized, and this was a heartbreaking thing, um, because my most formidable years in terms of like, who's kind of like shaped me in terms of my taste levels and movies was really like the nineties, right? And in the nineties, like the independent cinema just really got hot with like Clerks and Reservoir Dogs. And so, and, 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 you know, El Mariachi. So there was such a pride to indie film. What I came to realize is that you can only take that so far. You need to really, you know, depending on the story that you want to tell, you need resources. And the problem is, and this is the path that I was going down and I, and I had to get myself out of it. You know, if you, you make a movie for like a hundred grand, you know, it just, it's going to look for the most part kind of terrible, right? And you do a couple of those, well, people are going to look and go like, what's wrong with this dude? He's made two films. I've never heard of them. I don't know who's in it. They look like shit. Uh, I don't think this guy is good at all. So we're done. So it's like, oh man. So that's, that's a scary kind of like aspect, scary thing to fall into. So. Um, the indie scene, like, you know, I'm in the studio system now. And, and then on the, on the flip side is that all those cliche stories you hear about studio execs, at least for me, was not an issue. In fact, they were 
very supportive. And I, I, I do think one of the reasons why at least my executives were very supportive was again, from the very beginning, I was insanely specific. So what that did was fill my execs with a lot of confidence. It's like, oh, this dude's got it. Because whatever question, they, and that's the other thing, man, it's like, if, if you want to also direct, you have to know and understand every single department. I mean, every single one. Don't just tell your DP, it's like, ah, you know, I want it to look like sunshine over here. Know your lights, man. Like understand what lights you need. Know your lenses. Understand this. when you go to the difference, if you go to a DP and say, listen, man, you know, I kind of want like, you know, an 18K HMI here and we're going to shoot this on a 75 because, you know, I want to cross this, whatever. Your DP is going to go, this fucking guy knows what he's talking about. And because of that, I'm going to give him my all because now it seems like we're actually going to do something. You know, a lot of times it's like, got to take, again, account accountability in personally and professionally. Anytime that I've directed something and stuff started to fall apart, it is a result of my crew not having faith in my vision because I did not instill it. It is my fault. It is my fault. And unfortunately, crews are plagued with doing a, like a bunch of bad productions all year round. You know, the wardrobe people, all the same story. Makeup people, all the same story. g and &E, all the same story. And a lot of us, the director was just kind of like, ah, oh, I don't know, maybe we'll just kind of do this. I don't know, I don't know. And it's just like so wishy-washy. Nobody wants to follow that. You have to be a leader in all of your endeavors. And part of being the leader, again, is taking accountability of saying, I messed up. Kevin, you are really giving them a lot of gems and reiterating a lot of messages that they've been hearing from me since we started the program. Um, Gary and our under, other individual on the line, do you have a question for our speaker? Remember to turn your camera on if you do. Hi, Kevin. Uh, I'm Gary. I won Flip the Script last year, season three. I made a, a, a short film. It was a horror short film called Descent. Um, I guess... First of all, I want to say I'm very appreciative of being here. Like I throughout this whole interview, you you this is a great interview. All right. I'm I'm gonna be writing an article about this. You know what I'm saying? This is great. i I'm really enjoying myself and I'm really learning a lot. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um okay, I guess my question would be like because uh, like the, it's kind of connected to the last question. Um, because like you say you from a, a time where like indie films were like big at a time. I, I want to say, like, I, I think an impact of, like, indie films were, like, movie theaters and the fact that movie theaters are kind of, like, on a decline now, I think that kind of impacts independent filmmaking, too, because all of the big uh, companies or whatever are on streaming services now. And streaming services can be good for independent filmmakers, too, because you can look at Netflix and Google, stuff like that. But I want to just say, like, like, do you think that, like, movie theater, if movie, if movie theaters were, like, Mm, I do think that, like, if, if, if people were to increase the amount of movie theaters and people were able, like, like independent filmmakers were able to put their movies in filmmakers, would that help independent filmmaking? That's a great, that's a great question. I, but I, I think the, even within the premise of your question, like, you kind of have the answer that, answer there is that, you know, for the most part, independent cinema really is, you know, for streaming. And, and you know, the problem, I mean, look, I, I, love big budget movies as a matter of fact like that's kind of like you know like the way tom cruise views it like man we got to do this and for the audience I, I i'm of the same mind i love it that being said a lot of the independent like the smaller films are actually meant to be seen on the big screen and I, I don't know if you've ever seen like let's say bridesmaids right it was like a really funny you know comedy you know or there's something about mary i, I actually you know worked at the movie theater back then something about mary and let me tell you something, that's just a comedy. I think the budget was 20 million, 25 billion. And like that had to be seen in the theater. I mean, had to be seen in the theater. If, if that movie came out on streaming, it would have done nothing and had to be. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's an issue because, you know, the way um, theater dates are, you know, like a year in advance, it's very difficult to get a free weekend um, with a theater because, you know, a theater is there to make money as well. So if, if you're saying, Hey, look, you know, you have Mission Impossible for eight weeks, but can you spare a week for my film about, you know, a grasshopper, you know, that, that becomes a salesman, whatever, I don't know. They're going to look at you like, 
what the fuck? they'll call you the n-word like what the fuck? What? you know what i mean like it's not it's not going to go well um in terms of like the future streamers i mean net netflix was the canary in the coal mine because it showed what happens when you spend spend because listen it, it, in the tech world initially spending 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 and being constantly in debt is actually par for course a lot of people actually don't understand debt debt is not necessarily a bad thing the problem was with netflix you know all the roosters it all it, it all kind of like caught up with them where all of a sudden it was like oh okay we really overspent um our company is not worth this and now we have to downsize 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 so with the exception of apple that has you know a, an actual business attached to it you know what i mean like apple is, is excuse me i'm thinking of um well, Apple and Amazon, excuse me, it's Apple and Amazon, where they have other businesses attached, where their business model is a little bit different. So I, I you know, there's so many like different streaming services that might necess might not necessarily make it. You know what I mean? I, I think there, I think this with the streamers is gonna get small again. I, I think there's gonna be a lot of ones that end up selling to other companies like like Peacock. I don't know. I I, I think I think Peacock eventually is gonna have to like come to Jesus and go, let's just sell our entire library to, you know, whomever. Um, but but as a filmmaker, anything that gets made and and distributed in a way that's a professional manner that you didn't just upload yourself is really a win. You know, you just have to make peace with like the world is different. Like I wish, man, I wish the movie I just did was in a the theater, but no one was making it. I was like, there's no there's no universe where this movie gets into a theater. Zero, you know. Um, so like those, the days of old of, you know, maybe you've got a shot of getting your romantic comedy, but it's, it is slim to none, but as long as you are working, that's the, that's the important thing is that whatever you get made, you take that and you use that to build upon your career to make other things. And maybe eventually it will be a, a theater thing. You never know. Thank, yeah. Thanks for that. So yeah, no, I, I was just gonna, you know what I'm saying, thanks for that, I was just telling you what I get, you know I, so I gather, I think, like, so, in, like, filmmakers should try to, like, uh, make movies for streaming if they can, then eventually it'll, it'll get good enough to where you it can, like, show in theaters, and, you know what I'm saying, you, I, I'm, I, you, you probably can't find a theater to show your movie or whatever, but I think, like, independent filmmakers should try to aim for streaming, you know what I'm saying, make Tubi your best friend or something, or something like that. Thing. Yeah, I mean, so you, it's interesting you brought up Tubi because I that that was this this was a very interesting thing for me for the movie I just did because when I was approached about this movie and I first heard Tubi, I mean, listen, we all have world star hip hop. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be the most horrible shit. Like, no, 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 not realizing that Fox had bought Tubi for like four hundred million dollars. So Tubi had their coming out party during the Super Bowl and he had their commercial. You know, it's a Super Bowl commercial. So, and the executive was saying, listen, we are, we are changing what Tubi is all about. And, you know, cause the budget they gave me was, was significant. It was a full, I'm like, oh, okay, no, no, this is nice, you know? And I realized because I did have that thing. I was like, oh, why can't it be for like Hulu or Netflix, whatever. I realized, you know, when Netflix first came out, like in the very beginning, would you want to be at the ground floor then, or just part of the pack now? Would you want to be on the ground floor of the new Tubi now? That's the thought process. That's the thought process. You have to realize that, you know, just because something else seems very shiny, you might be passing up an opportunity to be the man at this streaming service that has actual money behind it. So I switched my thinking there. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate you and I wish you the best. And uh, again, appreciate you for this interview. It's, it's been great. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else got a question online? I see a screen. See I think Inti's trying to come in. The Voltex? Uh, sorry, I guess I'm. I don't. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. I can hear you, but there was definitely some Doctor Strange in the multiverse going on with the camera. <laughs> yeah. Um. I don't know what's going on with my camera. I apologize for that. But um, I just wanted to say um. Well, first of all, thank you for um all your uh, enlightenment on the filmmaking industry and stuff. Um. I'm. I'm part of True Star. I'm not with like this specific program so i'm writing an article on this but i do plan on um going into filmmaking for my career future career so it's all really illuminating and um my, my question for you was uh recently there like some streaming services like hbo max have been like deleting their 
content off of their platforms, like, and you can't find it anywhere. And I wanted to know, like, your opinion on, like, um, if you think this will impact, like, like future filmmakers and stuff, like, if you think this trend is going to keep happening, if you know anything about that. Yeah, so so it's actually something that's been going on forever. It, it's, it's actually not a, a new thing. You know, so there are films that I saw, like, you know, back in the 80s are, are not available, like, you can't get them anywhere. And it, it really just, it's, it's really an ec economic question, because... For instance, you know, you have a movie that is not very popular, no one's watching it, no one's making money off of it, and then said company still has to pay music licensing fees, still has to pay residuals to the actors, and they do the math problem going, since no one's really watching this piece of content and it's way more expensive to host it, we're going to shift it off somewhere else. So, that, so that's been happening like forever, forever and ever and ever. So it's, it's not anything new. I would just say the way it gets reported is something new. And, and, and listen, you know, it, it, it feels... It doesn't feel great when you're a filmmaker and you make something and it's like, well, we're going to send it here or whatever, because no one's really, what, because people are, because a streaming service is not going to do it to a very popular title. It wouldn't make sense. You know, it's, it's a business decision. So it's something that's always going to happen. It's something that's always has happened. Um, and, you know, people shouldn't, people shouldn't take it uh, as an offense or whatever. It, it really is just kind of a, a business decision, excuse me, a business decision. And I will say, I, I as an artist, I think it would do one's soul really, really well to understand the business aspects of the business because it's it, it, what tends to happen, unfortunately, again, in this climate when people write an article, people are always looking to rile someone up. You know what I mean? So it's just like, oh, this is good. This this is the HBO just kicked off this show. It's like, well, the licensing deal was over. It was it was going to leave anyway. It's like that's how things work. Licensing deals end, and it gets put up somewhere somewhere else. And if it's not economically viable, then you don't see it anymore. That's just that that is business. And at the very beginning of this talk, I when I talked about like you know minimum wage and 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 scale, I mean I really wanted to put you in the driver's seat of like if you're remodeling your own kitchen what decisions are you, are you going to make? And I think it's just important to understand that, you know, the business is a business. And although, you know, whether you consider yourself a technician writer or you may be an artist, depending on how you describe yourself, um, it doesn't absolve your responsibility to understand the, the inner workings of why people make certain business decisions. Thank you. What? Uh, yeah, I have one more question. So what's some advice or pointers that you have on building a community or a network full of other creators? And like, how do you go about working with them? It starts, I would say it starts with, with your talent and your work. Meaning, you know, I would say everyone, including myself, um, a lot of what I've done is because of someone taking a kindness to me or doing a favor or, you know, helping me out. I think, I don't know anyone who really doesn't have that story of someone kind of like reaching out, like I can help you. But what I think people need to understand is that when you are in that position to be helped, right, and you need help, you can't only be a taker. What is your value to this person? So I just try to tell people, you, you usually got like one shot of that, like, guys, I need a favor and, you know, can you help me, whatever. So you better make sure that whatever you're sending out or what you're doing, you're talking about is top notch. Because if you're a young filmmaker who's got a great, some great scripts and great ideas and, and really knowledgeable of the business, well, then guess what? You're actually a value add. Because, you know, the, the business is not static. There are people, there are people, just think about, and think about in the last 10 years, who was considered a super big A-list star. And now you're like, I don't even know where that person went. That person hasn't had, that person had a theatrical release in forever. So no one stays at the top forever and no one stays at the bottom forever either. So if you are, you know, if you've got your stuff and you're in your young 20s and, you know, they're going to help you out, well, you might be in a position to now reach and help that person who helped you. That's why you're a value add, and that's why mentors will help really talented people because they understand that, that this person may need to do me a favor or help me out in, in the future. So really, and, and it's really kind of the boring answer is that it, it comes down to you being the best that you can be. I don't mean to sound like a G.I. Joe slogan, but you know that really was what it comes down to is that it has to be, so I'll just say even for myself, when I 
pitch, right? Like I said, I love sales. I love this or whatever. I know that when I pitch something or if I someone reads something, if it's a pass, almost always it's like, it's just not something we're doing here. And I feel very confident in that. You know what I mean? Like everything is not for everyone. So that's why certain buyers have a certain thing. But I know it's not because I fucked up my pitch or my screenplay is bullshit. I just know that I am that confident in what I'm putting out there. And But it, that took decades, decades to get there. So that, so I'm, let me just say that it took a very long time for me to be confident and go, I know what I'm writing is really good or someone's going to read it. So I'm very comfortable sending myself out to anyone and everyone who wants to read it. Now, six years ago, maybe not. You know what I mean? Like they'll read something, that's eh, okay. Eh, it's just not that, you know, it's fine. You know, and I've gotten that throughout my career. And I've reread those screenplays that people said like, eh, it was okay. And guess what? It was, it was just okay. Sometimes even less than okay, you know? So yeah, I would just say like, there's, there's no substitute for all the hard work that you put into your career. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. So we are about time. Um, Kevin, thank you again for sharing your time and talent with us. We have a group of very talented uh, filmmakers here in this room and online. And I want to thank you for being open to helping them understand how they can build a career that will probably eclipse yours and mine both. So hopefully these guys will be in a position to reach back, flip the script and true star and even help us old folks out in the future. Um, but Kevin, how can they how can they find and follow your career? I'd say the the I am actually like actively and uh, you need to probably notice I don't post really anything of note or value on Facebook anymore because I just I've tapped out uh, onto the <laughs> to mass conversations. I can't take it. Um, but I would say in Instagram is definitely the best. It, it's, you know, even, even when I'm not necessarily that. Um, when it comes to like work stuff, that's when I start posting things on, on, on Instagram and whatnot. So that's the best place is Instagram. And, and my handle is just my full name. Thank you again for your time. And Kevin, I'll be reaching out to you offline for um, updates and keeping you posted on when we have our premiere, which we plan to have in October. I love it. I love it. I see you. I am very, very encouraged by the students I see here. Uh, I love it. Again, please just do your work. No one's trying to hold you back. You're not a victim. Take control of your life. Be excellent. That's all you got to do in life is be excellent. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just really want to say that. I know that's not a popular thing to say because, you know, I, people want to be coddled or whatever. I'm just telling you, when you put the work in, you succeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome.